Neil Rollicon is my name, and I'm it's a great honour to be here today with uh, many of my colleagues from what's known as the Lewis Group, which is the group which has um, basically been campaigning for light rail for about 20 years now in Galway. And we're, we're hoping it won't be another 20 years before we're all together riding around on a light rail uh, system in Galway. But we have some fantastic speakers here tonight from um, from the United States, from the United Kingdom, and from uh, Germany, um, who are all light rail aficionados and experts uh, to varying different degrees. I'm going to hand over in a few minutes to you to um, Parik O'Donoghue, who's um, going to chair the session. Professor Parik O'Donoghue um, was the Dean of Engineering in, um, in NUI Galway, at the National University of Ireland in Galway and a great honour to have him here as the chair tonight. Um, I think we have the best part of 30 politicians have signed up for this particular meeting, so that's fantastic. Um, you know, and we have people from, lots of people from Galway, from the community in particular. So really, I think it's going to be quite um, an event tonight and certainly a good tonic to this, this um, these COVID-19 words that I don't want to mention too much. So I think light rail is something that we all hope will bring us out of the, um, you know, the mire that we're in at the moment, and that that it's something that we can we can uh, definitely all look forward to in the future. And judging by the, you know, 300 plus people who've who've registered for this uh, webinar, it's it's quite extraordinary the enthusiasm now. Um, you know, so you're going to hear some really good things tonight. I think. Um, I'm going to drone on, but what I'm going to do is Senator Pauline O'Reilly, I don't know if she's here at the moment, but she um, very kindly arranged to get a video sent in by the Minister for Transport. Um, so I, uh, just a short um, video, about two and a half minutes, which is extra uh, to the agenda. So I'm going to play that. And then after that, I'm going to hand over straight over to um, our chair, Parik O'Donoghue, who's going to um, invite the speakers uh, to speak. So Hello. I'm sorry I can't be with you today, but I wish you well in this seminar on the whole issue of light rail in Galway and sustainable transport in the city. We all know the elements that are in play. On the rail side, we do need to twin track from Athen Rye to Kent, to Kent Station and really upgrade and improve the stations in Arnmore and elsewhere in, in uh, between. We know we want to deliver the cycling infrastructure has been long promised but not delivered. Those greenway routes from the likes of Moy Collin into the city and running right through down to Sawtail and out by a barn and back up to Moy Collin would make an incredible difference. Uh, and actually on every side of the city, completing the Dublin to Galway route coming in on the other side, those greenways aren't just for tourists and they're not primarily for tourists, they're for local people to help us move around, turn the city into a stunning cycling location, which it should be. Also, we've got the bus networks, the likes of the Crosslink service they do have to deliver. It's critical in my mind that that sort of infrastructure goes in even before we consider what has to be done on the roadside. But we also need to consider light rail. And what I've said to Pauline and others, local uh, representatives, is yes, we should and will review that delivery of light rail as a future possibility in Galway. People have always over the years said, oh, there isn't the density for that. But I would say back, but well, when we provide the infrastructure, then the density will build around it. It's called transport oriented development. It's the key to what we need to do next to make a zero carbon, net zero by 2050 solution in all our cities. What I've asked our officials to do is to include that within a review of the, great, of the Galway Transport Strategy, which we want to do next year. I think, and I've said the same thing in Cork and in other cities, is that we should look at possible models, the introduction of high quality, high frequency, high capacity bus services with the potential then, as we to see increased demand increasing, we see the potential to convert those to light rail solutions where we've got the road space, we've got the demand, and we've shown how it can work. It's one of the options that I believe a review will show up and I'm looking for that to take place next year is when we expect it to happen and I hope it informs your discussions here today and I look forward to hearing back the outcome of this seminar. Many thanks indeed. Okay, so um, that was the Minister for Transport, Eamon Ryan, and a short video. Um, that will be made available to all of you in due course. Um, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our Chair for this evening, um, Professor Parik O'Donoghue from NUI Galway. 
Uh, so Parikh, are you there? Uh, I am. Gormagot Nail Agus Smisha Parikh on a cool Oscar here in Golov. Fall to very Golov in Nut. We got a seminar great on shot. Baby kind free very light rail. Talk to our on special again, you know, Agus kind tourie on a smoola. So I'd like to welcome uh, everybody to this seminar uh, here this evening on very light rail. It should be a very exciting event. Uh, we're just coming up to almost 200. Uh, participants now at this stage. In particular, I'd like to welcome uh, Mayor of Galway and indeed several former mayors of Galway as well, <laughs> uh, our councillors, a uh, number of TDs, senators and other elected representatives. I think we have a really exciting programme here tonight for you uh, with international speakers and my colleagues on the Glues Committee have put in a lot of hard work in developing uh, this programme. I think we've just heard from the Minister and he has, in a sense, uh, been very encouraging, but also there's a challenge there for us uh, if light, going, light rail is going to be delivered for Galway. But I think our speakers that we have, we're going to hear about new technologies, and I think that these technologies can and will make uh, light rail viable for cities like Galway. At any rate, without further ado, I'll get over to the, our speakers. And our first speaker is uh, uh, Dave Andrews, who's from Bath, and he is a chair of the Bath and Bristol Trams Association, uh, promoting trams for uh, Bath, Bristol, and the surrounding area. The title of his presentation is Steel Wheel Trams for Galway and Bath. So I'd like to invite uh, Dave now to upload his presentation so we can hear from him. Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to have to race through this very quickly. Um, and make a lot of assertions and claims, but all these claims are backed up by actual experience and research, which you can find either on the live links that are in within the presentation or by going to the Bath Trams website. And there are a few bonus slides at the end of this presentation, which I'm not gonna go through tonight. I assume this will be presented. Right. Uh, the four things I want to show are four very simple things. Trams are likely the only way to reduce congestion and pollution in Galway at an affordable cost. Galway is more than large enough to support trams. Modern tram systems can be installed with minimum inconvenience and the tram system revitalizes the city and drives regeneration. Galway and Bath, both are, be are beautiful historic and univers university cities of about the same size and population. Correct. Yeah. Right. Uh, steel wheeled, by the way, this is not anti-bus, but steel wheel trams are better for city centres, routes and buses. Why is this? Rubber tyred buses are light, flimsy and cheap automotive vehicles lasting only about five years and are very expensive to operate and finance. And with few small doors leading to very slow boarding and deboarding at peak. Steel wheel trams are heavy, expensive rail vehicles with uh, very low operating and finance costs and with very many large doors, so ultra rapid boarding and deboarding. They can be done in 20 seconds typically. And these, this technical and economic fact leads directly to the fact that buses have to concentrate passengers by longer service intervals and cramming passengers together on bench seats. Trams on the other hand can afford to operate more frequently and no need to be full all the time. And no amount of rebranding this uh, buses or whatever type can alter that fact. I won't go into that now. Dave? Yeah. I think if you push the little picture at the bottom on the, just beside the sizing, uh, you'll get the whole screen up. Well, I did, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't paste through the slides. So I'll have to carry on like this. We tried that, Dick. Oh dear, okay. Yeah, we did try that. Um, these economic reasons explained over leaf directly to, but these, explained over, lead directly to buses being unacceptable to car drivers. And that's the key fact. Buses are not acceptable to car drivers. Buses are forced to be infrequent with a 20 minute service gap. You need to know a timetable. They're unreliable, uncomfortable, noisy and jerky rides. You're forced to sit in close proximity to strangers. They operate on a complicated network that is difficult to understand. They're considered of low prestige. Only a failure in life uses a bus, apparently Lady Thatch Thatcher said. And you're likely to be left behind at peak periods. And for these reasons, buses in the UK 
only provide about 10% of passenger journeys and 70% of travel in Bath are, are, are on cars, sorry. So in comparison, again, these are facts borne out by research. Trams do attract trips from cars because they offer a quantum improvement in public transport. They offer a frequent service, which can be six minutes. So that's just turn up and go. No need to remember a timetable. They run reliably. They have level boarding and a lighting and carry two wheelchairs with low level access. They give a smooth and jerk free ride, are quiet and pollution free. Trams are as fast as cars without the need to find a parking place. Waiting passengers never get left behind because the tram is too full. Trams are roomy and not force you do not force passengers to sit next to strangers, which they don't like. You can never get lost as it's easy to get back to the starting point. No need to know the routes. And that's ideal for tourists. Next slide. And Steel wheel trams have many other advantages. They're four to five times the line capacity of a bus service. The multiple large doors give rapid boarding and deboarding. The, and they have the capacity of a six lane road with the present mix of traffic, which is amazing. So one tram line will replace a six lane highway. They have a high level of reliability. There's more comfort, no bumps, judders, rattles, swerves, harsh braking with smooth acceleration. With green wave traffic signalling, which can't be easily applied to buses, they dramatically improve the operation of the road network. Over the lifetime, trams have a lower passenger cost per passenger kilometre than buses. And also there's no toxic tyre and dust pollution, which is in fact equal to the amount of pollution coming from a, a modern uh, vehicle engine exhaust. And, not doesn't end there, uh, trams can operate longer hours per day due to lower marginal operating costs. They emit no pollution with attracted car, car trips, actually reduce total emissions. With renewable generation, trams are zero CO2 in operation. They can also release city centre parking space for value added economic activities. And they enable development densities to be increased without the need for parking. As an example, Tramlink has reduced car traffic by 20% in London compared to congestion increases in the rest of London. And German companies will in fact not locate to a city without a tram. And they generally increase in live and economic activity. So an example of this is Freiburg, it's a model green city. Now what this slide is showing is that between, uh, from 1990 to 2008, while the population was growing, there's a much more rapid increase in tram usage and a slower increase in car traffic. And now, in fact, public transport exceeds that of cars. And if we compare um, Freiburg and York, which are similar cities, we can see that Freiburg beats York, which is using this uh, bendy bus thing at the bottom there. Um, in all categories, you've got nearly twice as many pedestrians, nearly twice as many cycling, you've halved the passenger and you've doubled the, uh, the public transport. So it works definitely in York compared to Freiburg. And, oh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, Dave, we're down to the last minute. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Sure. Now, there are at least 33 towns with trams the same size or smaller than Galway. So you can look at Bad Shandau, which has got 4,000 population or Valenciennes, which was recently reinstalled with trams in France, where France has reinstalled 33 trams now. So uh, Galway is well above the, the size needed for a tram. Um, we have had in Bath, we've had a feasibility study by the good professor Leslie, and using those studies, we managed to persuade the local authority to spend two million on proper studies for four tram routes. If you're worried about heritage, just go to Vienna and you'll see trams with the wires screwed to the Grand Opera House, or go to Rome and see trams trundling past the Colosseum. That, and that is the end, gen ladies and gentlemen. Okay, thank you for that, Dave. And as I said, uh, please see you keeping the time there. Uh, there are questions going to the chat box and we'll be taking those at the end. So please hold on and we'll get to those questions. 
So you were talking there about Freiburg, and that leads us very nicely into our next speaker, who's Andreas Hildebrand, who is the press spokesman for the transport company in Freiburg. I won't try and pronounce it, um, but uh, we're delighted to welcome here, him here today to talk to us. So you can upload your presentation there, please, Andreas. Yeah, I am. Um, I start immediately because I have not much time. Um, I, I do it in a language I call English. I hope you can understand me and I hope I can understand your questions afterwards. Um, public traffic, Freiburg, oh, Freiburg is a city that is located in the very southwest of Germany, close to the borders to France, here and Switzerland. Here is Rhine River, here is Black Forest. Uh, it is a medieval city like, like your city. It's founded in 1120. Nowadays, it has 235,000 inhabitants, and it is a very old uh, university town with uh, five universities and around about 32,000 students. When we started with the electric streetcar with a light rail, uh, it was the year 1901, and Freiburg had 70,000 inhabitants, so it's more a similarity to uh, Galway. And um, the picture is from the year 1906, and it shows the center of the city, the crossing of the two main, uh, main streets of the city center. And you can see even the first lines of slide rail went through this place. And this is the message of this picture. When you are planning a light rail system, you plan it in, in the place where people want to go and where they start their trips and not in the, somewhere in the, in the, in the surroundings. Um, in the year 2019, uh, we had only in the city of Freiburg, we, had, we, have, we operate bus and light rail system. We had 81.6 million uh, um, customers, passengers. That means around about 223,000 a day. This is nearly the number of uh, inhabitants of the city of Freiburg. So we just move everyone in Freiburg once a time every day, statistically, but um, we talking. We are talking about mobility in the city and mobility in the city is very important because uh, uh, the pol it's a political task and um, you have to make sure that everybody can reach every place every time. But the question is, what is the best mean of transport? And mobility causes problems. It needs the rare space in cities. Space in cities is not, you cannot multiply it. It generates noise and it causes air pollution. These are the big problems, but I think for, for city, for urban planners, uh, the most important thing is the, the, the thing with the space. And let me show you three pictures. They are quite old, but the message is up to date. This is a little congestion. Here's a traffic light, 40 cars. We know that in nearly every, everywhere in the world, we have in average 1.3 uh, passengers in one car. And uh, colleagues from France who put this, uh, this uh, picture, has had one person in every car. When we put, put away the cars, we have uh, much more space. And now imagine these people would have been taken a light rail train. They only need this amount of space. And uh, you can see it in Freiburg in some places. Uh, when you achieve it by, by a good and attractive system of public transportation based on the rail, the railway system, uh, you, win, you will win back place for nicer things than streets. Well, you can make nice bicycle lanes, for example, here. Uh, every, every, every city has its own history. And uh, Freiburg was, like many cities all over the world, was heavily destroyed in Second World War. <laughs> Only the biggest building was not destroyed, the, 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 the cathedral. And... Um, this is, a, this is a typical thing for Freiburg. Uh, the, um, uh, when in the most German cities who looked like this uh, were, were rebuilt in a very new way, like Hannover is, a, is an example. Uh, right angles, uh, big streets and so on. But uh, here in Freiburg, we decided that the medieval center, the medieval, old medieval center, uh, well, we, we had to make new buildings, but we built them in the historical, in the medieval ground plan. And this is the reason 
by um, even in the in the late 50s, <laughs> the town was full. It was not a mobility by car, it was an immobility by cars. And so we had to think um, what to do and um, how can we solve, how can we, how can we achieve mobility for everybody? Nowadays, it looks like this. In the background, you see one of the historical watchtowers from the old fortification. This is the oldest part of the town. Um, and um, well, you see, you reach it not so good by car, you reach it by bicycle, by light trail, you can see it in the background, and by walking. Freiburg has it's a city with a, it's, it has very many walkable distances. When you decide to invent, uh, uh, to, 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 to make a new light rail system, you have to spend money. And um, you, you must have the will to do that. But when you spend this money, you should it spend in an in a, in a intelligent kind of way. And uh, Dave told many things about this, I think. Uh, but here it's, it's, on, it's, it's the credo of, of attractive public transportation. It has to be fast, for example, priority at, at crossings uh, or tracks of their own and so on. It has to be cheap though, that people can afford it to use it. And it has to be, uh, Dave, Dave said this also, that's extremely important, easy, understandable. And uh, you, the, the rail-based system you see, you can see where it goes and you can have a clear line. A bus, you enter a bus, and when you are not a regular, not when you do do not use it regularly, uh, you perhaps do not know where it, where it will bring you. And the the, the ticket system is extremely exp is extremely um, important. It must be easy, understandable. Don't work with many zones and such things. But in times of digitalization, this is not the big problem in the, in the future. And it has to be available, available close to everybody or to as many people as possible and with a good frequency of uh, cars. And here is uh, as one example. This is the timetable, part of the timetable of our uh, streetcar light rail line number one. We have five lines. And you can see Monday to Friday, this is the yellow thing. Uh, it, uh, in the rush hour, we have every three, four minutes and from 8 a.m. to nearly 8 p.m. We have a light rail train every, every five, six minutes here on the other lines every seven and a half minutes. And on Saturdays, this orange and on Sundays and public holidays, the red thing, you can see we operate the whole night through uh, at midnight uh, every half an hour and so on. And then during the day, every seven minutes roundabout. Uh, the backbone of our system are the, uh, are the light rails. We have bus lines, around about 22 bus lines. But most of these bus lines are uh, bring persons from the surroundings, from the not so dense populated parts of the city to the next stop of the light rail system. And so more than 85% of our customers are customers of the light rail. Uh, when, you, when you build new tracks, you have to spend money and you should I, I give you the advice to build them always in the middle of the of the of the development. Here is a new city district we build it on 75 hectare, and the central axis here of um, of mobility is the light rail track with foot walks and uh, bicycle lanes. And on the streets, it's maximum uh, speed limit of maximum 30 kilometers an hour. No apartment is more than 400 meters away from one of the three stops. Um, and we operate every seven and a half minutes. And um, we have a, a car a, a, a park um, in, this, in this city district, 1,000 inhabitants own round about 330 cars. We have another um, city district, Vauban. Perhaps some of you had heard this name. It's, it's on an uh, old French barrack uh, region. 
and uh, there are now um, uh, 7,500 inhabitants there and uh, it's, it's car reduced, there are no garages, there are only two big on the side and they have, uh, as far as I know, 1,000 uh, inhabitants have less than 100 cars. Uh, I have the model split, it differs a little bit, perhaps it's another year. The public transportation, 17%, bicycle, 22. We are the warmest city in Germany with the best weather. It's good condition for bicycle drivers, walking and car only 34%. I remember very well when I started this job, um, the Lord Mayor, of, I, the figures looked a little bit another way around and the Lord Mayor said, our aim is we want to have the, the environmental friendly modes of transport two third and one third car, and this is what we have now. But I think this, it, it's not the end of the way. And um, yes, I, I'm, I possess a car myself and I love it and I use it, but you, you, you have to give your, your inhabitants the opportunity to think what is just in the moment the right mode of transport and what does make sense. We're probably in the last minute here, Andreas. Yeah, I could talk two hours about this topic okay. with more details, but now I'm ready. Okay, thank you. thank you very much for that, for keeping the time. And I'm always in awe of Freiburg and what they have done, what you have done. And I'm glad to say we can stick with the Freiburg team, theme now because we have our own Freiburg person here in Galway. That's uh, Professor uh, Ulf Stromar, who's Professor of Geography at NUI Galway. And uh, Ulf uh, has been active in the Gluis group here as well. So he's going to uh, give us his thoughts. So uh, Ulf, uh, where you go, please. Yeah, thanks. It's, it's, it's very fortuitous that uh, we have Andreas in our midst. Um, and uh, greetings from one fellow Freiburger to another. What I'd like to do just in, in the five or six minutes that I have here is really just to tease out, you know, what lessons can be gleaned from what Andreas was introducing us just a second ago. You know, my own experience in a way positions me. I, I grew through the 1960s, 70s and 80s in Freiburg. So a lot of the developments that Andreas was talking about are first nature to me, but for 20 years, I lived now in Galway. Now I'd like to do this in a number, in the form of a number of lessons that can be, can be adopted here. The first lesson, and I think arguably the most important one is that Planning for public transportation and urban planning need to be fully integrated. So it doesn't make any sense to, to plan for a tram line and to have another silo somewhere in Galway City Hall and not speaking to one another. They really need to be integrated in some form or another. And there are a number of pointers that Freiburg has engaged with that we could emulate. The first one was urban expansion. When I grew up in Freiburg. Freiburg was a city in the early 60s of 110,000. This is what Galway is aspiring to. But what they did is they intertwined, they politically realigned the city of Freiburg by incorporating the functionally intertwined hinterland, brought it into the city. This is something that um, some mayors in, in Galway have um, recommended we do, but it hasn't happened. And I'm not sure whether the purported um, integration of Galway city and Galway County will actually serve the same purpose, you know. So first lesson, when Freiburg committed to its trams, it was about where Galway is now population-wise. Second message, lesson, second lesson to be learned, that the tram system, once it's implemented, is totally expandable. And it can be expandable in line with urban planning ideas. Andreas mentioned the Rieselfeld. What he didn't mention is that right next to the Rieselfeld, Freiburg is now building yet another of these new quarters, the Dietenbach Gelände, you know, and at the cost of, Andreas can correct me, but I think it's three to four additional stops on the existing tram line, you can incorporate, you can access and provide access to another 16,000 people. In other words, if that integration of public transportation and urban planning is done well, you achieve economies of cost. And Ryan mentioned transport-oriented development within the city proper. Um, Andreas mentioned the 400 meter pet shed, you know, 400 meters as the, the distance that people walk towards the tram line. So if urban planning plus planning for a tram line are done in 
together, you know, you can very easily achieve this transport oriented development where people live close to a tram line and therefore will access it. Nodal densification means that along where the tram line stops, you actually allow buildings to go moderately up three to four stories, something easily accomplishable in Galway. Keep take our point home from this is that, and I saw that in the chat there, that some people say, well, Galway doesn't have the densities required for a tram line. Don't treat densities as given, they're made. And they're made partially by intelligent planning. Fourth point here, pedestrianization. Again, I saw in the chat that some people mentioned, you know, we'll have to pedestrianize the entirety of the inner city. Yes, we will have to do that. And arguably we should. When Freiburg pedestrianized, they pedestrianized the entirety of the old town. We, by contrasting, go, we have done it in a very piecemeal kind of manner. Fun point here, we need to redefine the togetherness between different modes of mobility. So the um, modal shift or split that, that Andreas was, was pointing towards needs to be implemented wherever those modes of transport coexist. And yes, this will allow us to achieve the 30 kmh center part in parts of the town. Give you an example here. On the left is obviously the ideal scenario, you know, where you have a tram line and a bicycle path right next to it. But the picture on the right is much more telling. This is actually on the Matthauser Straße, which I um, frequent whenever I see my, my, my mother, you know. Here you have a track in the middle. You have a reduced one car lane on either side. And then on the right next to that, you have cycle lanes being implemented. So it's this togetherness that needs to be achieved through intelligent planning. The key here, the key point really that I think that I want to drive home is that the city of Freiburg identified its future and invested into it. And it was its own future. It's not a future that was a carbon copy from somewhere else. People really sat down, debated, and thought clearly about what it is that they wanted. And they made, they decided to make a tram-based public transportation system, the core, the spine of this form of urban development. Lesson two, public transport can be and must be made attractive. Andreas was pointing into a lot of, or was mentioning a lot of these points, you know, and, and actually Dave before him mentioned, you know, that um, trams are proven to be more attractive than buses. We need a regular, fast, reliable, and regionally integrated um, service. And thanks Andreas for pointing, you know, putting a timetable up there, you know, um, which I always thought was very intelligent. You know, the fact that you have a, I thought you brought this in a couple of years ago, you know, that Saturday night, the trams run all through the night, you know, which is a very, very um, um, good in, in um, response to, to, to needs as they arise on the ground, you know. It needs to be inclusive, you know, Freiburg introduced was, I think, one of the first cities to buy low floor carriages, which allow people with push chairs or in wheelchairs to access those trams. So the inclusivity of a public transportation system is part of what makes it attractive. We need to talk about attractive design. You will have noticed on all the slides that have, the images that I showed before, that the tram is actually riding on what is known as a long track system. Again, Freiburg was one of the, the pioneers in this respect, you know. So don't construct technology in opposition to nature. They can be integrated. Freiburg was very, and I think, Andreas, you, you underplayed what Freiburg really did. You know, the introduction of what was then known as an Umweltkarte, now it's called a radio card, um, was really mind blowing at the time. And uh, my generation actually profited from that. You know, here you had a monthly transferable, transferable, note this, environmental ticket that allowed you, I have a slide in there in a second, to really access all of the hinterland. So, in Galway parlance, it would be a ticket that would allow you to take a bus all the way to, to Clifton and all the way at least to Athen Rye, using all of the kind of modes of transportation that are available. So if we combine lesson one and lesson two, attractive public transportation and the integration of planning and planning for public transportation, we can furthermore add to that that we have it easier here in Galway. Freiburg is a radial city, you know, it really spreads out 
okay, there's the Black Forest on one side, but there's a valley into the Black Forest. So it actually is more or less a radial one. We are living in a linear city, which with proper planning can be extended along that linear line from east to west, from Barna, say, to or and more in some form or another. It's just, I'm I not going to talk about this. I'm here, uh, Ulf, sorry. I am, I am. I'm, I'm fully on time. Don't worry. You know, it just, I'll, I'll leave this in here so people can digest it in their own. And this is the radio card in some form or another. Lesson two A, don't be afraid to innovate. Here's the, the um, lawn track and the low floor pioneer solution, perhaps. Innovation in Galway could come in the form of a very light rail solution. Lesson three, medieval city can coexist with a modern mass transportation system. Andreas mentioned those um, medieval watchtowers that guarded the entry points to the city. Trams go right through there. Um, probably at some point engineers in the 70s said, well, that can't be done. Well, it can be done. Final slide, final lesson. Um, if the aim of all of this investment into a tram-based public transportation system is the obvious one of creating and sustaining a livable, inclusive, low carbon city, it is also, and at the same time, a city that attracts inward investment in tourists. And Freiburg really has um, hit the, the, the nail on its head here in that regard. You know, not the least, because a city like Freiburg makes good headlines at home and abroad. Financial Times and BBC reporting here on Freiburg's credential as a green city. Once you've captured the public imagination, not just at home, not just in your home turf, German home turf, but for a global audience, I think Galway, again, would be well poised to present itself using those credentials. And if I want to see one thing happen is, you know, that we give a run for the money, um, and perhaps um, observe that crown in the fullness of time. Thanks for your attention, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Ulf, for that and very interesting perspectives on translating things into the Galway arena. Um, we're now going to, and apologies for rushing the speakers, we have a very full program. I don't want to keep everybody here all night, but we're now going to move uh, back to the UK. We're going to uh, Coventry. A, a city that is actually developing a light rail system as we speak. We have two speakers here, um, Nick Madison, who is a, talking about the new very light rail technology. Uh, he's with the uh, Black Country Innovative Manufacturing Centre. So I'll hand over to Nick then first. Thank you. Thanks for that. So, um, Nicola, next slide, please. So I'm, I'm here to um, introduce the, the subject or the topic of very light rail. Um, and I've been working in this area for the last seven years. Um, until last September, I was at Warwick Manufacturing Group at the University of Warwick. Uh, and uh, since last September, I've been the chief executive of the BCIMO, which is the legal entity that will run the, the Very Light Rail National Innovation Centre. Um, and what we're trying to do is take a step change in technology. Um, there's a big issue in the UK um, in that the, um, the cost of light rail uh, is very high. And basically light rail solutions are not affordable to the majority of um, towns and cities in the UK. Uh, light rail is restricted to about seven or eight cities. Um, so, um, so there's this problem that people in, uh, in local authorities want to have tram systems, but they simply cannot make the economic case to convince the UK government that they should invest. Um, and so I started looking at how could we use automotive technology to drive down the cost of the vehicles uh, and at the same time, looking at how you can reduce the cost of the civil engineering and the infrastructure, because that dominates the cost of a rail-based solution. So uh, over the last seven years, a couple of projects have uh, been running. One's called Revolution, which is about providing a much lower cost rail car for the rail network. And that led 
Coventry City to ask me whether a similar approach could be used to produce a low cost tram solution. And so what we're looking at is essentially a technology that will be relevant to both rail and urban rail solutions. Um, next slide, please, Nicola. Sorry, Nick, it doesn't seem to be moving. <laughs> uh, here we go. OK, so I've just mentioned uh, the Revolution project, the rail car, you can see it on the right. And that was the inspiration for Coventry to ask if something could be developed for urban rail. And you can see the picture of the Coventry shuttle vehicle there. Uh, Nicola's going to talk more about that in a minute. Next slide, please. Uh, and one of the things we're trying to do here is to provide end-to-end uh, -end public transport to encourage car drivers to abandon their cars, make the modal shift to public transport, and in particular, to more rail-based transport. And we're talking uh, about this as being a hub-to-home solution. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the um, benefits of very light rail because time is short. But um, you'll see this when you get a copy of the presentation, you'll be able to um, see those benefits. Next slide, please, Nicola. So the um, Innovation Centre that's under construction at the moment is intended to create um, total solutions based on very light rail technology, but also looking at reducing the cost of the infrastructure, removing the need for signalling, uh, providing real-time monitoring through 5G technology back to central control. Next slide. And here's some pictures of the test track that has uh, been completed. Uh, and you can see through the bridge, the uh, main body of the Innovation Centre going up. Next slide, please. Uh, so there's the Innovation Centre going up. It will have a large engineering workshop where we can work on um, vehicles, powertrains, uh, civil engineering um, and everything else that's needed to make a system. And what we're trying to push for is solutions which essentially you can buy off the shelf. Normally, a, a light rail scheme, uh, it's a, bes a, a bes bespoke scheme for a particular city. And that's why the risks and the construction times are relatively long. We are looking to provide an off-the-shelf solution. So over to you, uh, Nicola, to talk about the Coventry project. OK, thank you. I'll, thank you, Nick, uh, for setting the scene there. I'll, I'll uh, try and do a whistle-stop tour, quick run-through of the Coventry project. So Coventry, we're a small city, but we are an ambitious city. And we are very lucky to be led by visionary leaders who basically aspire to deliver attractive, affordable, modern, innovative transport to improve the city and make sure that it is an attractive place to live, work and study. We are the UK City of Culture this year and we're very keen to showcase some of the innovation that we're working on because it's not just very light rail that we have. We're also working on electric taxis, uh, e-scooters. We've got an urban airport coming to the city. So if you have the opportunity, come to Coventry this summer and, and, and look at our exhibition at the Transport Museum. So why are we investing our money in urban, very light rail? Well, like other cities across the UK and globally, we do have a problem with congestion. Pre-pandemic congestion levels were unacceptable and we also have a problem with air quality in the city. We do have NO2 exceedances and we are under ministerial directive to address that, that problem and bring down our NO2 levels. So it's very important to us that we deliver transport solutions that help us achieve modal shift. And what we know from looking at data is that trams are hugely successful in getting people out of their cars. They, they, you just have to look at the DFT statistics to see the passenger growth over the last 10 to 15 years. And the statistics speak for themselves. We know from looking at evidence that trams are successful because they have that permanence of way. People can see the route, they know it's there to stay, and that gives them confidence to use the service. And that's what we want for Coventry. We want to have that 
attractive transport mode that will achieve the modal shift that we need to make the, the city a better place to live, work and study. So what we're trying to do with Urban Very Light Rail is significantly reduce the costs of um, infrastructure delivery. We all know that current light rail systems are simply unaffordable for the smaller town or city. And our job and our research and development is all about bringing down the cost of light rail so that cities like Coventry, like Galway, can afford to implement light rail. Where we're looking to make significant cost savings is in the um, the laying of the track form within the highway. So I'll show you a slide which will show what we're trying to develop, but it's a much shallower track form which can sit within the surface layer of the highway. And as a result of it being a shallower track form, we are aiming to remove the need for utility diversions. It will have reduced earthworks and preliminary costs, and consequently it will reduce the overall cost per kilometre. So we're targeting around 10 million cost per kilometre for delivery. Current schemes are upwards of 25 million, sometimes as much as 100 million per kilometre in the city centre location. So that's the key goal and objective of our project. And if we don't achieve that low cost solution, we will have failed. So the good news that I can share with you tonight is that we have, this isn't just a pipe dream anymore. This is this is really happening. We've been busy over the last couple of years building the prototype vehicle, which you can see in this photo here. This was in the um, factory in uh, where it's been assembled um, about a month ago. It was, um, the assembly was complete and we are due to start testing of the vehicle in June time this year. So some quick images there of the interior. Um, and we did take the vehicle on a city tour on the back of the low loader because we had to transfer it from its assembly to another site where it um, is having some software uh, tests done on it now before it moves to Dudley for the testing on the track form. So key uh, features of the vehicle, it's a zero emission battery operated vehicle, low floor design. It's extremely light rate with uh, three to four tonnes per axle. Um, it will have capacity for around 56 with 20 seated. I'll speed on through. This isn't just about creating a new mode that's attractive um, for smaller cities. We are looking to build a new uh, supply chain, a new manufacturing capability within the UK, but we have used, um, we've managed to secure 67% from UK uh, manufacturing. Um, with the supply chain coming from the Midlands, um, with just 33% from overseas. But you can look at this slide in more detail when we share them with you. So the track form, this is the key um, element of the project where we're really seeking to innovate. So current track systems are around 600 mil deep. And as a result of that, you have to dig deep into the highway and you have to move all of these utilities out of the way at a cost of around 9 million per kilometre. So by developing this shallow track form, the idea is you can lay them on top of existing um, services and remove that 9 million cost per kilometre. So this is the real linchpin of the project, but we are confident in the concept design that we've come up with. And we're currently um, in the detailed design process and we'll be building component parts to test that it meets our specification later on this year. So the plan for us in Coventry is to have a first route that connects the rail station to the city centre and out to the university hospital, which is a a busy route, it's very congested, the parking situation at the hospital is a real problem. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a problem that we do need to address with an attractive transport solution. Um, but the ultimate goal is to have a network of routes connect the rail station and the city centre with strategic locations on the outskirts. So we've, we're um, home to some major employers such as Jaguar Land Rover. We've got the University of Warwick on our doorstep who we've been working with on this project since, um, well, since Nick, as Nick mentioned back in 2016. Um, and we've got Coventry Arena um, as well that we would connect to. So we are looking at this network development uh, in parallel to the R&D programme. And I just want to end by saying that Very Light Rail 
it's um, it's an integral part of an integrated solution. We're not saying it's the panacea. We know it won't solve all of our congestion problems. It's very much as all was saying part of an integrated transport solution. So we are looking at electric vehicles, e-taxis, electric bus network, dynamic wireless charging, autonomous pods for last mile connectivity, and of course the humble bicycle, um, which I use uh, as often as I can. I love to ride my bike and, and, and pedestrianization as well. So all of those, that integrated transport mix that will make the city an attractive place. Uh, just to summarise with our timing, we're currently in the R&D phase and we're looking to um, carry out integrated system proving over the next couple of years. We then move into the consenting and planning phase, um, building our uh, design concept for the first route, the business case and submission of the legal process to have a railway within the highway, which is known as the Transport Works Act order in the UK. And then we'd look to start constructing the first route in 2024 with an operational section in late 2025. I should add that that is subject to securing sufficient funding and obviously going through the legal process and um, having Secretary of State approval to proceed. But that's that's it from me, a quick whistle stop tour of um, Coventry Very Light Rail and very happy to come back and speak on it in more detail should you want to hear more. Thanks very much for that, Nicola. And Nic that was Nicola Small, who is with uh, Coventry City Council, where she is the Senior Rail Programme Manager. Uh, very, very interesting from yourself and Nick there, showing us what uh, Very Light Rail can do. And uh, I think it might open up an exciting future uh, for other cities. So finally, we'll move on to our last speaker, who is uh, Brad Reed. Brad is uh, from the US, from California. So it's good morning to you, Brad. And uh, he is with a company, Tig M, and they are currently manufacturing uh, streetcars, uh, railways, uh, vehicles uh, for cities right around the world with a focus on uh, very light rail solutions. Over to you, Brad, if you want to load up your presentation. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, the group for having me here to speak today. Very excited to speak to you all. My name is Brad Reed. I'm the president of TIGM. We build self-powered uh, trams. We were the winner in 2020 of Manufacturer of the Year at the International Light Awards. When I say self-powered trams, I mean battery-operated hydrogen hybrid trams, which carry all power for a full 20-hour service day carried on board each car. That means no overhead wire, no charging at stations, no wayside power systems of any kind. We build 200 passenger articulated modern trams, 100 passenger modern trams, and 80 passenger heritage style trams. All of our trams use battery hydrogen propulsion. All TIGM systems are designed, built, and operated under European norms. We are an international transportation design, build, operate, maintain firm. These are some of our projects all around the world. TIGAM's mission is to reduce streetcar infrastructure impacts and costs by, by eliminating the need for continuous off-board electrification systems. TIGAM has spent the past 20 years perfecting every system and subsystem in the streetcar to operate at minimum energy consumption while maximizing power and safety as required in a transit vehicle system. TIGM streetcars require no overhead catenary or any other type of external power supply operating entirely on an internal battery hybrid system. TIGM delivers turnkey street railway systems through international DBFOM contracts. That's design, build, finance, operate, maintain, including feasibility studies with detailed demand analysis, project financing, civil design and track engineering, maintenance facility design, track construction, design and fabrication of streetcars, and operations and maintenance. When you talk about the advantages of steel rail transit over rubber tired systems, we always bring up the fact that steel wheel transit experiences only 15% of the rolling resistance of rubber tired vehicles. Rail transit vehicles last on average four times longer. Rubber tired transit produces hazardous non-tailpipe pollution. Even if they're electric, they still pollute. Tracks structurally improve the street surface, extending its usable lifetime. 
published statistics show that real estate values within one quarter mile each side of a permanent guideway on average increased by a factor of four times that of city averages. And this does not happen with bus lines. Wayside power systems represent on average 30 to 50% of the cost of streetcar infrastructure. Wayside power systems re represent a single point failure mode. Wayside power systems have greater impact on the built environment than the vehicles. And by eliminating wayside power systems, you can eliminate the high cost of infrastructure, both CapEx and OpEx, and the resistance of the public to visible power lines, poles, and substations. Tegan manufactures battery dominant, serial hybrid, self-powered electric trams. This is our 100 passenger MRV3. It's a single body monitored streetcar. It's operating now in the city of Doha, Qatar. It's been operating for a year and a half with, with uh, public passengers. It's been uh, operating there about two years in total. Oops, sorry about that. Here is a little video you can see. TIGM designed and built everything on the street here, the tracks, the roadway, the track maintenance vehicle that is specifically designed for this system. And here are three of our 100 passenger trams operating in platoon. So this is the 300 passenger consist right here. Our, our vehicles are very advanced systems, including virtual tram detection, next tram arrival, proximity sensing, onboard CCTV, 360 degrees inside and out, IP camera broadcasting with an onboard Cisco wireless access point. We can, uh, we can uh, watch the performance from our factory in California, anywhere in the world. This is our TIGM MRV4 articulated 200 passenger modern streetcar. All of these cars, uh, qualify as very light rail, having a, a, an axle load of under five tons. This is our uh, virtual coupler system. I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Virtual coupler is the ability to couple vehicles non-mechanically. What you see here is a consist of 300 passenger streetcar that is comprised of three 100 passenger streetcars. Scalable trans, tram size, size means at non-mechanical vehicle coupling at the push of a button. Trams can be sized to reflect the demands of peak and off-peak hours, reducing excessive driver costs and eliminating deadheading of empty seats. With our 100 and 200 passenger trams, we can join them together non-mechanically to pr provide 300 and 400 passenger consists. Looks like this, three 100 passenger trams coming together from three different alignments or headways. Two drivers go back to the depot and the consist pulls away as a 300 passenger tram at the control of one driver. You can do the same thing with our MRV4 vehicle. Two vehicles pull into a station from two different alignments or headways. One of the drivers goes back to the depot and the consist drives ahead as a 400 passenger tram under the control of one driver. Now our track installation, it is non-electrified, low impact, rapid and inexpensive to build. When you put together our low impact track form, it's only 10 inches deep and panelized track, we can minimize or eliminate utilities relocation. We actually pass over the sections where utilities cannot be moved and we uh, put in a panelized section that can be re removed in a matter of hours. TIGM installed everything here curb to curb in Doha, Qatar in 2016. Now, when you talk about our propulsion system, each car carries two major lithium iron phosphate battery banks with state-of-the-art battery management systems and a hydrogen fuel cell generator. Together, this represents resiliency. Three sources of power, which are redundant and always available to the operator to prevent, to prevent any breakdowns and provide 20 hours of continuous operation without having to require any other form of power. We put in our own hydrogen fueling stations. On-site hydrogen production eliminates the high cost of transportation, distribution, and transfer losses. We create hydrogen from the electrolysis of water. We purify it, compress it, and dispense it once per day to the TIGM streetcar. Here is uh, the hydrogen fueling and production plant before and after being installed in the first 
hydrogen fueling station in the Emirate of Dubai. This is our carbon neutral, renewable energy based self powered tramway philosophy. We have had the good uh, fortune to be able to deliver the first two carbon neutral public transportation systems in Texas and Aruba. We uh, create renewable energy, we sell it to the grid, we use it to create hydrogen continually 24 seven. We buy back our energy from the grid at off peak hours at a profit savings to the client. And between advanced batteries, hydrogen fuel cell and regenerative braking, we can power heritage and modern street railway 20 hours per day with no acquisition of wayside power whatsoever. Thank you very much for your interest in our street railways and we hope we can be of service to you. Thank you very much, Brad. Again, very exciting technologies uh, that we see there and certainly the whole, what I can uh, see, things are changing rapidly in very light rail and they are becoming more accessible for all cities. So we're going to take questions that have come in on the chat and we're certainly looking at the chat here for the last hour. And my thanks to the speakers, by the way, for keeping uh, to time here this evening. Uh, based on the chat that's come in, there is a lot going on. There are a lot of things that I know that Niall has been uh, keeping track of these and will be uh, passing on these questions. Uh, so the first one that I have uh, from him is, I suppose, just about Galway, a city of 80,000 people. Can it support uh, very light rail? Is the city too small? And maybe one of our speakers uh, might, might want to take that. I think, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Nick. I think the big issue with um, smaller cities, um, it depends on the frequency that you want the vehicles to travel uh, at, um, because the, the dominating cost, once you've got your system, uh, is the cost of the drivers. Um, so uh, if you've got a very small system, um, you know, you, you may only need to employ a relatively few drivers, but the best solution ultimately will be to remove the drivers from the trams. And, and that will become uh, feasible in the, the relatively near future, either by making the trams autonomous or by using a central control um, room uh, where in effect the trams will be operated remotely. So uh, I th for me, that is one of the big issues in any public transport, it's the actual cost of the drivers. I'd like to uh, answer that if I might. Please, Brad. Um, the design of any system should be based on a very detailed feasibility study with a demand analysis. Now, any city can support a streetcar system depending on the uh, ridership and the will of, of the uh, government and the public to pay for it. Now, I think the better question is, can Galway afford not to put in a streetcar system? As the city expands, you want to be able to provide a service to make life livable and more attractive to every new resident who comes into the city. As the city grows, the streetcar system can grow with it. But there is no doubt that you can build a, a small streetcar line in a city of 80,000 people. We're working in cities smaller than that around the world. And uh, depending on how you uh, join fare box revenue, advertising, and sponsorships, along with a public sector uh, ability to make up shortfall, you can pay easily pay for the operational costs. What we do is bring in a private sector uh, financing group that will pay for the CapEx and will uh, accept payment back for the system over a 20 year period, bringing the costs way down at a low interest. Okay, thanks Brad. I wonder if you could maybe just expand a little bit on what you were talking there about the, on the cost of finance side, about designing, constructing and financing. Um, could you expand on that a little bit for us uh, in the Galway context? I'm sorry, who was that for? Oh, uh, this is for me again, uh, Brad. Oh, sorry, for you, Brad, if you, if you could expand. Oh, 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 okay. Sorry. Yeah, first of all, um, what TIGAM would do in a situation like this, uh, we're an international design builder and we, we bring in uh, international public-private partnership uh, in, 
under a DBFOM contract. First, TIGAM would design a system which would maximize ridership and minimize CapEx. That's all done through design. Second, we would bring 100% of the CapEx from our private sector financing partners guaranteed by the XM Bank, the Export Import Bank of the United States government. Third, we would use local contractors for all civil works using our partner Stecken for Portugal for steel track installation, just the steel part. Everything else is done by local contractors. Fourth, we would either work in joint development with local transit agency to create an operations group, or alternately, we would joint venture with one of our international partners for operations and maintenance. Now, um, definitely Nick was correct in saying that the major portion of operations costs is the cost of drivers, the cost of maintainers as well. Operations is mainly hourly labor. That's what the cost of operations boils down to. So you want to reduce the number of drivers. We do that through our vir virtual coupling, reducing the number of drivers to the maximum by joining and, and, and de-joining trams into groups that will address the peak hour prices, the peak hour uh, capacity, and reducing the size of the trams to uh, uh, reflect the off-peak hours. So there are, there are many ways. Uh, and the reduced track form, the um, uh, panelized track to avoid all uh, utilities relocation, bring the cost of the CapEx way down. Okay, thanks for that, Brad. It is obviously a big challenge in, in the financing. Um, could I ask, or I'm just picking questions out of the chat here, I'm just uh, uh, one, this may be to either Nicola or to Andreas, it's about, and maybe even harks back to what uh, our minister was saying at the beginning about, you know, you, you're cycling, you other, other forms of public transport, you pedestrians, and uh, how, I suppose, how was the integration of the light rail done uh, into uh, those systems and what were the particular problems uh, that were encountered? Nicola or, or Sorry, yeah, I was just unmuting. Uh, yeah, we're looking, you know, a holistic approach to how we deal with transport in the city. And we'd be looking at how we manage the network as a whole. So diverting traffic away from the very uh, light rail routes. Um, available for a segregated route. Um, so we'd be working with our um, cycle network planning team to make sure that cyclists are catered for um, in parallel to the first route. Um, the same with pedestrians. We, 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 we would work with the transport planners in each of the uh, key transport provide um, in each of the areas to make sure that we offer an integrated approach. So that's how we plan to develop the system for Coventry. So right now we're in the design phase for the first route and we're already engaging with the relevant um, officers to make sure that we make provision for cyclists and pedestrians as we develop the first route design. Thank you for that, Nicola. Andreas, do you want to comment as well, maybe? Uh, yes, um, the the plannings for new tracks, for new light rail tracks, is not uh, the not the task of my company. It's the task of the city of Freiburg, and when the when the um, city council decides we will build that new line, the project comes to us, and we are responsible for the rest, for the building, for the construction, and so on, and for the traffic, for the operation on, after that. And how a track looks like, how it is integrated in the rest of the mobility depends very much where it is. When it is in the, in the uh, old town region, it's much more complicated than when you build the new, new uh, developments like Rieselfeld or Dietenbach. And um, so are the costs very difficult, uh, different uh, from, from many different circumstances that accompany such a, a projects like that. Um, so the, the integration, the, the formal integration uh, is this thing of the city of Freiburg. And uh, if possible, we build tracks on the, uh, the uh, build light rails on tracks on their own, but it's not possible in every situation in the city. 
Okay, thank you for that. Um, it, next question, uh, would are buses not a better, more affordable and more flexible solution than VLR? Um, maybe Dave, we might like to hear from you on that one if uh, nobody else wants to come in. I'll, I'm happy to come in. Okay, thanks. Mate. There's, a lot, there's a lot of evidence that the people that love driving cars will never move a bus. Um, but there is, I don't know what it is, whether it's a class thing, uh, but people that um, are used to commuting and traveling in the cars, um, they don't mind as much if they're, if they're asked to travel by train. Um, there seems to be something about trains, uh, vehicles running on rails, which is acceptable to car drivers. Getting on a bus, there is definitely evidence that there's an issue there for a lot of people. So uh, buses, I think, are the easy way out. You can buy them quickly. Uh, now they've got batteries on, they're eco-friendly, but they still do not provide the comfort and the um, regular... Uh, travel journey times that you can get with a, a light rail scheme. Andreas? Uh, when we open new, uh, new light rail lines, uh, they normally is, they replace bus lines. And we always have a look what, what, what uh, are the developments then. Uh, and um, in, uh, in, by the change from bus to light rail, the number of customers along these lines raised different from one project to another between 15 and 40 percent. Mm. Thanks. Um, by the way, I'm conscious of the time. We're now at um, 8.15 and I'd like to finish up in uh, certainly before 8.30 uh, on this, but I see we still have a lot of people online, so obviously plenty of interest uh, here. Uh, Brad, I think you wanted to come in as well on this point, did you? Yes, I would. Um... Certainly, uh, Nick's correct that uh, passengers prefer rail, and they always will. They're, they uh, Rail lines uh, enjoy a modal shift from automobile traffic of around 12 to 15 percent, which buses do not. However, there is always a use for the buses in the walkable city plan. What we intend to do is replace the most uh, bus uh, heavy traffic systems with light rail. The bus systems become feeder lines for the light rail. We have park and rides at the periphery of the city, non-fixed guideway feeding passengers to the fixed guideway, the fixed guideway feeding passengers to micro-mobility solutions in the urban core, thereby creating a walkable lifestyle for the entire city. People who choose to leave their cars at home, have a solution to get anywhere within a five-minute walk and a six-minute headway to anywhere in the city. That's what we should be after. Buses play a crucial role in that. We can't put street railway down every street in the city, but we can run bus lines in the periphery to bring passengers to the light rail lines. Thanks for that. Um, just a Question on, uh, sorry, Dave, you wanted to come in. Uh, there. I just wanted to make one point. Um, I'm surprised no one's raised this. A lot of people say, well, the big advantage of a bus is it, it, that it's flexible and that the big disadvantage of a tram is that it's inflexible. But it's exactly the other way around. The advantage of a tram is it is fixed and inflexible. And what that does is to the permanence of the, of the tram line or the rail line encourages developers and that can be the offices or, or house builders to build along the line. And you don't get that with buses. So it's the mere fact that you've got an expensive, prestigious fixed line will attract its own passengers. It's a virtuous circle. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, next question will be on the issue, let's say, of emissions and uh, energy, etc. And uh, any comments, any further comments there on light rail versus uh, other forms of transport, what would be the benefits in terms of uh, reducing emissions, uh, maybe not meeting, uh, if we don't meet our EU targets, for example. Uh, anybody want to comment on, on that aspect of things? 
Well, I'll uh, track say something. Zero. Go ahead. Brad? All tramways are electric, uh, or 99% of them are, which is a great reduction uh, from vehicle mile travel, uh, automobile pollution. But what we also want to do is to eliminate the uh, emissions created in construction and in operations and maintenance. So we're eliminating all of the uh, installation of the wayside power systems. We're bringing the cost of electricity and power propulsion power down by making the vehicles lighter. The auxiliary power units on board our system is uh, hydrogen produced by renewable energy. So we have zero emission from the harvesting of the energy through the work at the wheel. So this is, the intent should be a carbon neutral public transportation system. Okay, thank you for that, Brad. We were going to, sorry, Lewis. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Porig. The big saving comes from getting people out of cars. The absolute doubt. And Dave made this point and Andrea Andreas made the point from Freiburg as well. And the great advantage of all rail transport, as Brad has said, is that it's acceptable to people who use the car for every journey. Therefore, the problem in Galway is that its medieval town centre is just compatible with mass car use. So it needs something that will get people out of cars. And all the evidence shows, as Nick has pointed out, that people will get out of cars and go by rail, but they won't get out of cars and go by bus. Good luck to you, everybody. Thanks, Lewis, for that. Um, I think we probably have had a, a long evening at this stage, and uh, we need to start to wrap up at this point. So uh, what, uh, we are, what I will do now is I'll invite Brendan Holland, who's the chair of our Lewis committee here in Galway, uh, to make some uh, closing remarks, reflections on what I think has been a super evening. My thanks yet again to all the speakers. Fabulous stuff here. And my colleagues who uh, put all this together, uh, Niall, Mort, uh, Brendan, <coughs> etc. Brendan Holland. Need your microphone on now, Brendan. Okay, you're. It's, uh... Sorry, Brett. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Brendan. Or Margaret, Monica, or Margaret Neil. To all of more on the convention, you know, more career of the Lewis BLR than Galev. Firstly, I would like to thank the speakers, these excellent speakers. I'd like to thank the minister for taking his time to, to add his piece. And I certainly would like to thank the organizing committee for making this webinar possible. It was all done on a voluntary basis. To, to you, the attendees, I hope you got an insight into what we are trying to achieve for a long-term Galway. We only touched on the tip of the iceberg. I trust, Mr. Mayor, that when we are free of COVID, the Council will invite some of these speakers to come and see Galway firsthand and make, further make a further presentation to the City Council in person. They have a lot to give and we have a lot to learn. I am certain about one thing. We will come through, come through this pandemic and things will return to some form of normality. What that normality will be, nobody can rightly tell. However, if it has given us time to reflect on what we want our city to look like in the future. Traffic congestion has blighted this city for decades and we have reached a crossroads where choices, brave choices, must be made. We must be prepared to embrace new technology to solve old problems. The speakers this evening have told us that new ferry light rail technology is here now. What the Council is proposing to do with Bus Connect is not a million miles from what we are proposing at Lewis Ferry Light Rail. Their aims are to reduce the number of cars on our roads, to enable people to live in a healthier, cleaner environment, to make active transport modes more attractive to use, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to bring Galway into the 21st century as a thriving, smart city, and to make it even more welcoming tourist industry and new residents. They are working on plans to achieve all of this. The Lewis Committee 
also aim to see these objectives being achieved. We simply believe that very light rail is a much better vehicle. The City Council was of the same opinion 10 years ago when it adopted the development plan in which it stated that the Council's preferred mode of transport is light rail. The Council will seek funding to progress this mode. Our up, the consultant's engineers on the ring road, has predicted that the model share of public transport in Galway City in 2039 will only be 8.1%. That figure is based on the ring road being built, the Galway strategy, transport strategy, including bus connection, being fully implemented. And that parking provisions in the future developments be reduced by 50%. This means, however, that 91.9 .9 of us will not be using public transport. This is just not good enough. The speakers this evening have shown us that implementing very light rail in Galway can contribute to achieving a public transport mode share of 20%. This percentage can only grow in a sustainable manner as more lines are added to the network. In turn, also resulting in growth in the modal share of cycling and walking. The objective of Galway in the national planning framework is that the population of Galway will grow by 50% by over the next 20 years to a population of 120,000. This objective will not be achieved without a public transport system that its residents and visitors have confidence in. Without it, car traffic will strangle the city to the point where quality of life is even more seriously impacted than it already is. Employees value, uh, employees value quality of life. Multinational companies recognize that the best employees can afford to move to where the best quality of life is to be had. And those companies will leave and follow them. Tourists will find it more and more attractive to go elsewhere. Already a large slice of Galway's domestic economy finds it easier to shop in Limerick and at Lone and other nearby centres than face the burden of traffic in Galway. I appeal to you, city and county councillors, along with the officials, to champion this very light rail as a game changer for Galway. In doing so, you will leave a legacy for generations to come. The minister who has been a long-term supporter can do nothing without local support. 24,000 signatures on a petition two years ago, organised by Las Cancorla, Catherine Conley, uh, confirmed the citizens have a desire for change. To all our local Dáil, to all our local Dáil and Senate members who have fully embraced this project, I thank each and every one of you. The National Development Plan broadly outlines that the regions uh, outside the eastern seaboard grow and enhance the overall economy. It is a good plan. To those who devised and voted the plan, this is your chance to show that the good plan is not just fine words and hollow promises. So where do we go from here? I like what the minister said tonight. If you build it, they will come our words to that effect. Last November, the Minister for Transport said to the, in the Dáil, I recently met with the Galway-based stakeholders who had an interest in a new light rail technology emerging in the UK. And there may be a merit for this technology at a point in the future. You have heard this tonight. The new light rail technology is here and now. We welcome the, the Minister of Transport's positive statement in the Dáil four weeks ago when he said, I agree about the merits of a feasibility study for light rail in Galway. We will commission and deliver that. This must be an independent feasibility study. We consider that the most modern technology available, which are appropriate to our city and which we will enable it to reach a population of 120,000 in 2040. 
The Galway Transport Strategy did not consider light rail systems that were appropriate for Galway. And even since the Galway Transport System was devised, the new Climate Action Bill has made a number of its targets redundant. The terms of reference must include the delivery of a zero emission transport system that can facilitate the sustainable growth of the city in 2040 and far beyond it. A wide range of stakeholders, including ourselves and Lewis, must be given the opportunity to have our say in the drawing up of the terms of reference. Otherwise, it is doomed to fail. We are very confident that an independent feasibility study will show that very light rail is the best way forward for our children and our grandchildren's future. And for the long-term sustainability development of which we believe has the potential to be the greatest little city in the world. I would like to thank all your speakers particularly, but it was just something that struck me when Brad said, what Brad said, he said words to the effect, can Galway not afford to plan for its future? And that I think we must be the yardstick we measure. We must look to the future. Garmila Magad, Galair, August Mara, Jerfer Asquelga, Ganairi on Thraklak, Slan Anish, August Banuk.